apocalypse with one of those electronic magnetic pulses and it kills the power. Those of you Bible app people, you're going to be stuck. Why is that? The power will be done. The grid will be off. Why? I just said, if there's ever an apocalypse with like, you know... <laughs> just kidding. All right, y'all, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 this morning. Yeah. Welcome. We're in part three of a series called Indwelling, Becoming a Church that Hosts the Presence of God. Y'all, I'm feeling it. Chuck, I love you, brother. I love you. Man, you're hearing from God. You're bringing it. Come on. Anyway, Acts chapter 2. So, if you, if, you, if you missed the last couple weeks, I'll recap it real quick. If you want to go back and hear it, we are now officially podcasting. So you can go to iTunes and search for King's Church of Lexington. Or you can go to kingschurch.net slash media and you can find those there. And David's working on getting us high tech to be, have a YouTube channel. Right? Beyond me right there. So let me, let me recap real quick. We're in Acts chapter 2 this morning, becoming a church that hosts the Holy Spirit of God, hosts the presence of God. From last week, this is what we talked about. In Jesus, a new era of God's presence is introduced into the earth. Christ becomes the new temple, hosting the presence in a new way. Three things we talked about. In Jesus, the temple was replaced and fulfilled. He looks at it, he goes in and he cleanses it and completes the purpose of the temple by becoming the perfect final sacrifice. He was a spotless lamb. In Jesus, the presence shifts from the old temple to the new himself. And in Jesus, that presence then is released into the world. So he begins his ministry by receiving the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He ends his ministry by looking at the disciples and telling them, wait for the promise of the Father. And in John 20, it says he breathes the Holy Spirit on them. And he says, receive the Spirit. That's like a taste. It's like a little appetizer of, what, of, of the good stuff that's to come. And he says this in Acts 1, verse 3. He's, he's talking to them giving him some last instructions. He's about, to be, he's about to ascend into heaven right before their eyes. But he looks at him and he says this. He says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. John baptized with water, says Jesus, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So that was his final words to them. And he, and he sort of Leaves. He leaves bodily in his body. His body ascends up into the heavens and they see him and he disappears and they're gone and they're just standing there going, okay, now what do we do? They talk about it and they, they gather together. And the Bible says then in Acts 2, it says this, we're going to read this together. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. So that's the setting. And settings are very important in the Gospels. When things happen, where they happen, who's there. These are all really important context. And the day of Pentecost is a huge context. We think of it as sort of just this upper room experience. Pentecost was an ancient festival for, for Jesus and the disciples and the people of Israel going way far back. In fact, there are three, well, there's more than one, but there are three pilgrimage festivals for the, for the people of Israel, historically speaking. One of those was the Feast of Tents or the Feast of Tabernacles. This happened in the fall around this time, right? Some of you know that? Okay. And it celebrated the autumn harvest. In the spring, there was a Feast of Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the Feast of Passover celebrated God's deliverance of the people out of slavery in Egypt. And God told them to commemorate this every year with a festival. They were to celebrate that special time when, uh, when, when, when they were slaves in Egypt and they painted blood over their doorposts so that the angel of death would pass over their house as he went about killing all of the firstborn in Egypt as the final plague, as the final plague before they were released into the desert. So Passover. And God told the ancient people, remember this every year, celebrate this every year, and come together. So um, the Feast of Passover says is a spring feast commemorating Exodus. Fifty days later, after Passover, was the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of the, or the Feast of First Fruit. Who can say that? Feast of First Fruits. Say it five times without know, tripping over your mouth, right? It's called the Feast of Weeks because it happens seven weeks after Passover. Literally, it's seven sevens. Seven weeks later, it happens after Passover, and it's, uh, it's, it's celebrating 
uh, the, spring, the spring harvest as well, the beginnings of the spring harvest. The festival of, uh, of first fruits was also associated in, in their minds with the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And that's, that's really important. I want to say it again, okay? So I'm, I'm stumbling over my words already. I didn't have enough coffee. Someone bear with me here. Passover. Deliverance out of Egypt. The people leave through the Red Sea. Waters part. When Moses goes through, they're in the desert. 50 days after they are brought out of Egypt, they're at the base of the mountain, and God gives them the law at Mount Sinai. He hands them, he hands Moses these tablets of stone with the law of God on it. And he inaugurates this covenant with them. He promises to be their God if they walk in faithfulness to the law that he's given. So all through Israel's history, these two festivals were hugely important. They, sort of, they kind of had a double meaning. You know, so Passover is, it's, it's, it's wonderful. 50 days later, first fruits, we're going to celebrate not only the beginning of the harvest, in other words, um, the first of the, of, of the crops that are coming up, we're going to cut these down and bring them in as an offering to the Lord. And there's a whole other teaching on first fruits and what that means. But it also, it also commemorates the fact that God gave them the law at Sinai. He inaugurated this covenant with them. So Pentecost is sort of, you know, by the time of Jesus, all of this is wrapped up together into one big celebration. They're very aware of, of Passover, what that means. We know that Jesus was crucified during Passover, and he became the Passover lamb, the final sacrifice uh, that atoned for the sin of the people. And now, 50 days after his death, the disciples are still in Jerusalem, and Jesus is lifted up from the heaven, and he says, wait for the promise that my, uh, that my father gave you. And the Bible says in Acts 2 that they are sitting on the day of Pentecost. On that 50th day, they're gathered together in that place waiting. In fact, they're having a prayer meeting. That's what they're doing. They're coming together just like we were doing earlier, just like we've done every week. We come together, we lift our voices up, we cry out. So let's just read the account in Acts 2. It's up here. If you don't have a, if you don't have a Bible with you or your app with you, it says this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. All right, let's pray real quick. Holy Spirit, we pray for a great, greater understanding of the, the events that we just read about. Lord, we know this is history. This is reality. This uh, such a turning point in the life of your people and we want to understand it more and we want to live in this reality more today, tomorrow, and in the days to come. Make it so by your spirit. Amen. What happened at Pentecost? I'm wondering this. Is it possible that this is a recreation a part two, a version 2.0 of what happened back in Exodus. I think it is. And here's why I say that. Number one, 
In Acts chapter 2, God is powerfully, visibly, supernaturally revealed. So what did the first Pentecost look like? What did the first Pentecost look like? We can read about it. It's in Exodus 19. This is the first giving of the law. This is the first enact. This is the enacting of the first covenant. The Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. That's big right there. That's a huge. People have never seen God at this point. They don't know anything about him. God says, get ready because on the third day, I'm coming down. Goes on to say this, put limits for the people around the mountain. Tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. You can't even get near to where God is. You're going to fall over dead. Don't even come near it. Stand so far back. Don't even touch the ground that I'm inhabiting or you will be struck dead. They're to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. Look at that. You, 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 you like it. Okay, I'm not even talking about that. <laughs> no person or animal, no animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Imagine Moses saying all of this stuff for the first time. He got, guys, I got some good news and some bad news. The good news is you're about to meet the Lord. The bad news is, I'm not sure we want to meet the Lord. If you so much as to make a misstep, you're going to be dead, and we can't even touch you. He consecrated them, and they washed their clothes. He said to the people, prepare yourself for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. And then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. <laughs> Y'all say that together. Come on. The Lord, the Lord descended on it in fire. This is the first Pentecost. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. I've never been in an earthquake, but I've been, it's a pretty scary thing. But especially one like this where the whole mountain is shaking and there's fire and there's smoke and everything just seems to be like breaking from the bowels of the earth about to come out. And this is God moving on his people. And it's meant to produce awe and reverence. God wants them to know I am an all-consuming fire. You know, we, we don't pray that over our children very much, do we? I think about that. What do we pray over our kids? That God's a loving father, which is true. You know, God's a good shepherd, which is true. God is a creator, which is true. We don't, we don't tend to tell our kids, by the way, kids, God's a consuming fire. We certainly don't pray it over them. Holy Spirit, let be a consuming fire in, in, in Lottie's life. Maybe we should. Maybe we should pray that over our kids. Be a, be a visible, powerful, supernatural God to them. And in Acts 2, the same thing is happening. They are reliving now their own Sinai experience. Fire comes down. The whole place is shaking. There's noise. God is supernaturally revealed. Here's the second thing that happens at Pentecost. The ministry of Christ is validated. Validated means to assure of the truthfulness of a claim. And what are Jesus' claims? What did he claim to be or claim to do? Basically, he said, look, I, I, if you want life, I'm the source of it. If you want access to the Father, it's through me. If you want the kingdom, I'm the only way. I'm the door. I'm the door. I'm the gate. I'm the source of life. I'm the vine. He made these claims all over the place. And at the end of his life, now his disciples are wondering, okay, maybe the people are wondering, is this Jesus just a lunatic? He said a whole lot of stuff. What's happening here? And all of a sudden, the Spirit shows up just like he promised. And the claims that he made begin to make sense. 
The Holy Spirit, we talked about this last week, the Holy Spirit was all in Jesus' life. The Holy Spirit was there at his birth. The Holy Spirit falls on him at his baptism. The Holy Spirit drives him into the desert, minister him. Everything that he's doing, he's doing in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's doing wonders and signs and miracles in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's giving prophetic words in the power of the Holy Spirit. And at the end of it, he breathes on his disciples and he promises, by the way, guys, the Spirit is going to baptize you just like the Father promised. Now, in Acts 2, he shows up, and sure enough, Jesus, what Jesus said and did is now validated. And it's almost like he's the new Moses, right? What did Moses do? Moses is the one who brought them out of deliverance. Moses is the one who goes, to, uh, goes on behalf of the people to the, uh, to, to, uh, up to God, up to the mountain. He's the intercessor. Now Jesus is the new intercessor. Jesus is the new Moses. Jesus is the one who by his blood has delivered them from sin and now stands on their behalf inter interceding and has promised the Spirit. So let's read a couple of things here. The ministry of Christ being validated. Acts 2, 22. After this, by the way, the people scatter out in, the, in that upper room. And everybody outside in Jerusalem, Jerusalem is wondering what's happened. And Peter stands up to give this address to explain what's happening. And he talks about it. And he says this. I got to have my glasses on. I can't see where that is. All right. He says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. He's talking to everybody out here. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles. Wonders and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. Peter says, you can't deny it. You know what he did. You saw stuff. Everybody has seen him do. Everybody's seen him raise the dead and heal the sick. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Goes on to say this. He says, God has raised, in, in verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and poured out what you now see in here. Jesus received it and he's poured it out. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Y'all with me? Y'all awake? All right. Call for quiet. Get some coffee going. The ministry of Christ is validated. Number three, the new covenant. And then because of that, the new covenant is given. This is, this is the new Pentecost, the new covenant. The old covenant was here, Moses are the tablets written on stone, carved in stone. And Moses brings them down and he reads them to the people. All the thou shalt nots, thou shalt nots. All the things that they have to do to, to live up to God's expectations of them. All the things that they need to do to be a holy people. But this is the new covenant. At Pentecost, the law is given not on stone tablets, but it's carved into the human heart. This is, this is a deal. This is a game changer. You see, there are two parts of what God wants to do in the human heart. And Exodus is a good sort of snapshot of this. The goal of Exodus is not just deliverance. We mentioned this two weeks ago. It's not just coming out of slavery. What's the goal of Exodus? Promised land. Promised land. That's it. The people living as God's people with God in their heads. What's the goal of the cross? What's the goal? What's the purpose of the cross? Same idea. Not just forgiveness of our sins, but what? Presence. 
We're forgiven of our sins so that the Holy Spirit can now live inside this temple and God can be here with us. Look at Acts 2, verse 37. It says this. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the first part. That's the essential. That's the cleansing of the temple. But it goes on to say this, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The goal of the cross is not just forgiveness, it's presence. And this is what that, this is what that new covenant does. It enables the Spirit to live inside of us. You know, and this is, these are, these are shifts that, are, that, that, that I, I think are happening more and more in churches is we're, we're recognizing that the full, the full story of the gospel is not just get forgiven of your sins. We're leaving half of it out. The other part is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Be, have the victorious Christian life. When I was like 14, I was in this organization called Civil Air Patrol, you know? I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I was like an Air Force wannabe. I wanted to be in the Air Force so bad when I was 14 or 15. So I joined Civil Air Patrol. We got to do cool stuff. We got to wear like little mini Air Force uniforms, you know, and go on hiking things. And, but we also got to fly a lot. Um, and I remember one time that we got to fly in a glider, like a, like a toe-behind legitimate glider. You know, the, the fuselage was maybe, you know, like wide enough for one person up here and one person back there, but the wings were like 15 feet on either side. It's this huge thing. And of course, a glider doesn't have what? Doesn't have an engine. No engine on this thing. All that's on the front of it is like a little eye hook where you hook on a tow rope and then that plane out there that has the engine pulls it up into the air. So we get to fly in this thing, right? Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. I was like strapping it on. It's going to be so awesome. It's so much fun. And we're taking off, you know, and the little says is up there begins to pull us off and the wings on this glider are so long. They're like flapping like this all over the place. I'm getting a little bit nervous now going, wait a minute. We don't have an engine on this. What's going to happen? Take off, fly, however many thousand feet up in the air. Um, and I, you know, I'm feeling comfortable because I still feel like the power of, you know, moving along. But all of a sudden they release the tow rope. And the little says now whatever goes veering off this way disappears. And it is absolute silent. And I'm just looking around going, we are flying in a plane without an engine, <laughs> you know? And it's so much, it's so still, and you just feel like you're just on top of the world, you know? And eventually we kind of, you know, glider pilot, they know how to do this, they know how to land these things. You just sort of coast, you just make this big old looping circles all the way down for the next 20 minutes and land the plane, you know? And I, years later, I'm still struck by that. We're meant to be up there. But we have no power on our own to do that. Amen. We're meant to live at this level up here. But we have no power on our own to do that. We're meant to live victorious lives, as the old people in the church would say. But we have no power on our own to do this. We're not meant to be enslaved to sin all the time. We're not meant to walk around beaten and defeated all the time. We're meant to live in this new reality, in this new covenant, where all of a sudden the law of God is on our hearts and we all of a sudden find ourselves wanting to do the right thing. I remember when that was such a, it wasn't, it wasn't even a reality to me. I remember it was such a struggle. I would read the things in here and I would say, I don't want to do this. I don't want to obey God. I mean, I kind of did, but I found that it was always a struggle in my heart. It was a battle all the time. It's like, why? Why am I drawn to all this junk over here? Why can't I want good things? Why can't I be drawn to like godly friends instead of these ungodly friends? Why am I always being pulled in this wrong direction? And it really wasn't until I just became aware of the reality of the Holy Spirit living inside of me that that began to change. My nature began to change. My desires began to change. What I hungered for began to reflect this instead of this. What I began to think about, what I find my mind dwelling on, was now good things instead of bad things. 
And it wasn't because I was so self-disciplined. I was not. I promise you I was not. I was like the most undisciplined kid in the world. You know, it wasn't because I, I memorized scripture enough. I didn't beat myself into submission. I just was walking with the Spirit season after season and yielding to Him and saying, Lord, you've got to fix this. Help me. Change whatever the DNA in my heart is where I stop being self-destructive and I start being like, you know, what's the opposite of self-destructive? Self-constructive, right? <laughs> We're meant to be up there, but we don't have the power to do it. And Acts 2 is all about this new covenant being a reality where Jesus says, I can do this. And all of a sudden, it begins, the Old Testament begins to make perfect sense now. People of Israel, you were never meant to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and keep the letter of the law perfectly. You couldn't do it, God says. It was never going to happen. But you needed to know that for yourselves. You needed to discover that for yourselves. You needed to realize that the only way that you were going to walk in covenant faithfulness with me, with me was to be dead and brought to life with new hearts. And that's the promise of the Spirit. That's the promise of the Father right there. It's not just the Holy Spirit coming to give us signs and wonders and gifts. Those are all wonderful. Those are all beautiful. That's really not the heart of it. Part of it is presence of God so that we can be with Him. So that we can do the things that He wants us to do and live the way that He wants us to live. So a new covenant is given. The fourth thing here is the church, the church is born. Acts 2, 40 through 47. Let's read this. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. That's big growth, that's big growth y'all. How many do we have on our first day, Meg? 32. 32 people on our first week. We had like 55 last week, right? Something like that, David, whatever it is. 45, I think. Imagine if 3,000 people all of a sudden showed up. So whatever it is you guys have, King's Church, we want it too. Here we are. Get ready. <laughs> yeah, we, we, have some, we have some challenges. Oh, man. Our kids. Bless them. <laughs> but this is what happens. Oh, I'm still reading. Oh, yeah. Those who accepted his mission baptized, about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many signs and wonders performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. There's a temple again. We talked about that. Morning. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Church is born. Jesus. Exodus is a birth narrative. Come on, man. God birth is birth birth is. Hey, where are you? <laughs> that is Kentucky language right there. God, God births his people out of Egypt and says, now you are set apart. Gospels, they're birth stories. Jesus is born. The word made flesh now is born into the world. Acts is a birth story. The church is now born and sent out into the world. And it begins a continuous flow of spiritual replication that continues to this day. Y'all, this is, this is where we are. This right here. We're part of that. We're part of the DNA of Acts chapter 2. We're in, that, we're in that stream. We're in that sort of trajectory of what God did. Continuous flow of spiritual replication that continues to this day. This got me thinking about the nature of the Holy Spirit in our church. It got me thinking about gas. Petroleum gas, by the way, not bodily gas. I'm moving on. <laughs> Petroleum gas. Imagine if you had a 
10 gallon container of gas, right? We could do several things with that. We could put it out in that parking lot and somehow like a light a match, throw it out there, what would it do? It'd be crazy, it'd be nuts. That much combustion, that much of an explosion, probably set a couple cars on fire, probably rattle the ground, shatter everywhere, go up, get a lot of attention, right? We could also take that gas, 10, 10 gallons, and put it in one of your cars. And we could use the mechanics of the internal combustion engine to harness that power, to use that power, not in a singular explosive kind of way, but to take that car and now transport a person hundreds of miles away. Powerful explosion or a slow, continuous burn, it's the same Holy Spirit. What we see here in Acts chapter 2 is a pretty explosive thing. And we see some other little explosive things all throughout the book of Acts. We've even seen some in our own history and in our own lives. And I think we're going to see some explosive things even in our churches in the, in the days and the weeks and the months to come. But there's also just the slow burn of the Holy Spirit that just walks with us. And this is what we're going to look at in the next two weeks. I'll, I'll, I'll tip you off as to what these are. Two ways that we as individuals host the presence. That's what we're going to move into. So this is about the church. Next week, we're going to look at, the next two weeks, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit and the life of the individual. Two ways that we're, we host the presence. One is by the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, the resting presence of the Holy Spirit, that slow burn, that constant, all the time, awareness. And then the following week, we're going to look at the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit, the times when he just catches on fire and blows up and people see and people are aware of that. Both of those are realities. Both of those are kingdom realities in our churches and in, it's, it's, it's going to be in your life. Hold on. Come on. Y'all, I'm excited about this. I'm excited about just being something new and something exciting. Think about our own children and them being born in just those early days, you know. And just watching them grow and looking at them and just knowing that they are meant for great things. Church, we're meant for great things. King's Church is meant for great kingdom exploits. We're meant to host the presence of God collectively here, personally here, in our families, wherever we go. We're going to see God begin to move. An unbroken flow of the presence of God. All right, Brian. Come on up, man. Let's just do some prayer and ministry time. And then... Mm.